Well, I want to start off by showing a, a photo of our home, of our planet, the Earth. Uh, when I look at this, I don't see any boundaries. I don't see any lines dividing us. I see us as one planet, one people, one country, one, one species, all working together. We're going to have to, in the future, I think we're going to have to collaborate more than try and dominate over one another. We're going to have to ask to uh, communicate more than just take things or, or want them. We're going to have to think about uh, sharing instead of just uh, um, using capitalism as a way of getting things that we want. We're going to have to care and barter it. And, um, I want to start by talking a little bit about my steward crest. This is my uh, tapper. It says in Latin, courage grows strong in a wound. Right now in America, I think that we have a really massive wound that we're not talking about. And this wound is our addiction to fossil fuels. It's deeply hurting not only our economy, but our future environment that we're not only leaving for ourselves to inherit, but future generations. Um, when I was nine years old, my father passed away, and I inherited about $30,000 worth of uh, ExxonMobil stocks. And for about a decade, 17 years now, I've been following the, the oil markets and I came across something that I think everyone should know about and think about as they prepare for the future. And this thing is uh, peak oil. In the 1956, this geologist that was working for Shell uh, by the name of N. King Hubbard predicted by 1970 that the oil production for America would peak and that we would be in a state of decline for oil production till we run out completely. When you first do an oil field, you introduce it and it grows in production. Eventually it matures and it declines. Right now, most of our uh, economy runs on oil fields that are 50, 60 years old. We explored the entire planet for oil for the past 150 years. And we found most of it in the 1960s. The larger fields that we're relying on today, they're, they're well into the age of maturity and they're getting into the age of decline. Uh, when you add up each individual well, you'll find that there's a, a overlapping curve. And all of these um, wells add up to a point where you'll have a plateau of energy. And this is called peak oil, when your, your production won't meet the demand anymore. Recently, uh, there was a World Energy Outlook report by the, uh, the IEA, the International Energy Agency. And they produced a picture of all the world's production of oil over the next coming 50 years, 35 years. This blue part right here is all the current oil fields. As I said before, we're relying more on older fields, so we're going to see a drop in production. The gray part are the fields yet to be developed. The whole idea of developing these different uh, oil wells in the Gulf of Mexico and in Anwar and in other uh, regions that they're going to be really, really expensive to produce if we go ahead with it. But even then, it's not going to continue to produce more oil. We're going to have to go into unconventional oil, such as tar sands, and um, uh, deeper and deeper into uh, our oceans to get the oil that we need to continue our economy. But this is going to be very expensive, and the price of gasoline is going to go up. And the IEA reported that the conventional fuels have already uh, peaked in 2006. So from now on, we're going to actually be fighting to con get more oil out of the ground. It's going to be a very difficult process, so we're going to have to change. One cubic mile of oil is really condensed energy. In order to get a cubic mile of oil, the amount of energy you would need, you would need four Three Gorges dams, the big dams that they built in China, you would need to build that year after year for 50 years just to, to come up with the same amount of energy that a cubic mile of oil has. Or you would have to build 104 coal fire plants year after year for 50 years just to match the declining uh, rate of production that our oil has. Uh, wind turbines, you need over 32,000 you would need over 91 million uh, solar panels if you wanted to produce the same amount of electricity as a, a mile, a cubic mile of oil would produce. And the same with nuclear power. It's 50, 52 nuclear power plants. So even if we did 
uh, a green movement, we're going to have to still contend with this uh, declining production of oil. We can produce all the solar panels we want, but if we don't change how we need oil, if we don't get away from needing it completely, then we're going to have to uh, face some difficulties with our economy. And then you get into the climate change. We were, you, uh, our last presentation talked about the science of climate change, and I want to go a little deeper. I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm trying to be realistic and optimistic, though, because I think that we have a chance to really change our, our climate and not get into this drastic part that I'm going to be talking about. Um, this is the, from NOAA, the, no, uh, the National or uh, Ocean and Atmospheric Association. And this talks about the ocean's heating over the past uh, 40 years. This is Arctic sea ice. The IPCC, the International uh, Panel on Climate Change, produced all these reports. And if you see this black line, this is the satellite information. All of our projections, we're actually losing more ice than we're projected to. We're actually uh, warming a lot faster than the scientists were expecting. Uh, these are margins of the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, let me go back with that last one. This is Arctic sea ice. That's the ice that's sitting on top of the water. It, if you think about ice cubes in your glass, when the ice cubes melt, it doesn't raise the water. But if you have ice cubes sitting on top of those ice cubes and they melt, they'll actually raise the, the sea level of that, uh, the level of the water in your drink that you're drinking. So this ice, when it melts, it's not going to raise the sea level. But this ice in Greenland, it's sitting above the sea level. So any ice that melts from here is going to raise the sea level. Now overall, if all of Greenland melted, we would see about 6 meters of sea level rise. And it's not expected to melt that much. But we're expecting about a meter rise of sea level. So I'm going to, the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you what uh, the different projections are for Florida. This is present day. All the gray areas are places where people are living right now. This would be a meter rise of uh, sea level. 10% of the land would be covered. A uh, million and a half people would have to be dislocated. Would you lose over $150 billion of infrastructure that we built on the sea coast? This would be two meter level rise. This would be three, four, five, and eventually six. You can see all the gray areas are covered. Anyone that's living on the coast is going to have to migrate. This is going to be happening in all our lifetimes. This is something that's, that scientists are trying to understand, but every projection that they're making, it's far worse than they're projecting. But that's the realistic part. I want to talk to you more about the optimistic part. Because right now is a time that we have the opportunity to change. We can come together and we can do this. And so I built this website called Code Green Community. I wanted to talk, uh, I wanted to form a, a website where we can collaborate and find out what people are doing in their own backyards. So we can, we can mimic it and do it in our yards and we can change our lifestyle as well as changing our politics to make uh, climate change not a reality. I think that we can bend the curve. Uh, this is our website. Uh, all members can add photos, videos, they can add blogs, they can set up events. It's very collaborative. This is our member map. We have over 260 people all over the Tampa Bay area communicating and collaborating. Uh, what I've been following is uh, the transition handbook. It talks about how you can set up an organization in your hometown and transition your town away from fossil fuels, working at a small level where you live. Because it's not really about changing the world, it's about changing your world. It's about changing the world that you and your family and your friends and your neighbors live in. One of the tools that I found also, as well as the transition handbook, is permaculture. Uh, permaculture is a design science. It talks about looking at the world and keeping ethics and different patterns and designing your world based on, upon those uh, different things. Uh, there's three ethics, care of the earth, care for people, and fair share. 
I think fair share is one of the hardest things to uh, think about. But if you think about like a fruit tree, a fruit tree doesn't produce fruit for just one organism in a, in a forest. It produces fruit for everyone. It produces it in abundance. And anything you do in your life, you're going to have lots of abundance. And so we should get into this mode of thinking that we should share a lot of the abundance that we have. Mm -hmm. And if we keep in mind that we should have the ethics of caring for the earth and caring for people, we can get some of the, uh, we can design the systems that we live in to be more appropriate for those. And there's different ways of looking at the world. Uh, it, there's 12 different principles in permaculture, and each principle you think about when you design a system, most permaculturists, they design homes, or they design farms, or they even get it onto a larger scale, and they design communities. So the first one is observe and interact. If you look at something you, and un try and understand it and interact with it very slowly, you can make adjustments that are based upon your ethics. Uh, catch and store energy. So uh, for instance, when I was learning about permaculture, I was going around my house and I was looking and observing and I saw my air conditioner vent. It dripped water every single day. And so I put a bucket underneath it. And I stored that energy, that matter. And every single day over the summertime, when there was no rain, my AC was producing 10 gallons of water every single day. And so I used that water to, to water my garden. By observing and, and storing energy that I saw that was wasted, I could produce something out of it. Uh, obtaining a yield. Everything that you do in life should have some kind of value that you can either share or, or sell or barter to someone else. So I think in permaculture, one of the th problems, that, uh, or in the green movement, is we feel like we're doing stuff, but we're not yielding anything. So it's very important that we make a yield out of whatever we do. Uh, Self-regulate. We have to accept feedback. Uh, sometimes when you're observing, you're, you'll see that something's not working out. So instead of beating your head against a wall, you need to accept that sometimes uh, there, there's a communication going on saying that something's not going to work, so you need to adjust yourself. Uh, use and value renewables. Uh, in permaculture, we try and use more renewable energies, more natural uh, materials. Produce no, wa no waste. It's an uh, uh, earthworm. I think that's one of the, the best things. I think waste is a food. If we start looking at waste as something that we can reuse in our society and make products out of or, or do good things with, then that's something that's a shift. Because right now, when we throw something away, we just assume that it goes somewhere. But really, it's going to a landfill and it's piling up. We could use those waste as a product. Um, designed from pattern to detail. Uh, the natural world is full of different patterns, weather patterns, economic patterns, business patterns. So we have to constantly observe these patterns and regulate ourselves compared to that. Uh, integrate. How can we make things work together? So going back with my AC, my AC doesn't work with my garden. But if I store and capture the water that drips off, I can use that water to water my garden. So I'm integrating my AC unit into my garden. And I'm going to show you different ways of how you can do this, too. Uh, use and value uh, diversity. I think uh, we live in a world that's full of diversity, and we should always value it. It's something that, that it's, uh, it's just ingrained with nature. Uh, use small and slow solutions. I think a lot of our solutions that we come up with are huge and grandiose. So if we focus on the small things first and do it for ourselves personally and work on from that, that's how we build real change. And then lastly, creatively use and respond to change. I think the next 50 or 60 years are going to be full of different things that we can't expect. So we're always going to have to be on our toes and designing and changing as times come. So it's nice to talk about all these ethics and principles, but what does it really mean? So this is a, a little picture that I like. It starts with the ethics, care of the earth, care of people, and, and fair share. So how can you make an autonomous home that has all of its energy and it takes care of its waste and its water? Or how can you make someone that's disabled have a chance to be productive and, and make a yield in this world? Or how can we share our knowledge and our information and, and what we produce at a farmer's market? And how can we use more buses and bicycles and maybe instead of just having grasses on the side of our roads, why can't we plant fruit trees or vegetable gardens so we can make the land be productive again? And I think 
one of the most important things is knowledge sharing. This is a way of how can we share our knowledge that we've all been accumulating over the years. Uh, permaculture also has different domains. You start with the ethics and designs and you work your way out. And their different domains work with different things. Permaculturists like to use, uh, like to think about how you can integrate all these different things into whatever project you're working on. So if you're working on um, land and, and nature stewardship, you would be talking about agroforestry or seed saving or starting a, a community garden or with building. I know a permaculturist, he's making an earth ship down in Mayaka, which is in Sarasota. A earth ship, they use building materials straight out of the earth like sand and dirt and they fill uh, uh, used tires with this dirt and it makes insulated walls that you can have your home use far less energy by using the earth material instead of, natural, uh, instead of building material that aren't natural. Uh, tools and technology, a lot, I know of uh, a lot of uh, permacultures, they love solar powered pumps. They'll use a solar power pump for their pond and they'll use that to, to pump and irrigate their garden. So we use technology and tools when they're appropriate, appropriate and need to be used. Uh, education and culture. Uh, I think most of what we're thinking about in the green movement, it's a cultural movement. We're going to have to shift our way of thinking and shift our culture from constantly needing new things to constantly reusing old things. Uh, health and spiritual well-being. If we can make a more well-rounded individual, from that well-rounded individual, we can be a better society. A lot of um, in normal industrial culture, we, we don't like to think about being a, a well Well, I think we do, but I don't know where I was going with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Finance and economics. I think if peak oil and climate change are going to be affecting our economy, we're going to have to rethink our economy and readjust with that. Uh, one thing in permaculture they talk about is ethical investing. Is it, in, is it a real investment to um, invest in banks and, and in mortgages right now? Or is it better to invest into a CSA, which is a, a community supported agriculture? Why don't we invest in what we use on a daily and frequent basis and make it more sustainable? And then lastly is land tenure and community governors. Uh, the transition handbook came from Rob Hopkins. He was actually a permaculture teacher. He asked his students, how can we design our local community to use less oil? So they, they uh, thought about the next 10 years, and they thought, this is the perfect uh, way of living. And then they backcast from that 10-year mark and thought about the different things that they could integrate using permaculture. And they came to uh, form this transition handbook out of this, and they jotted down a lot of the information that they got out of this, uh, this transition uh, community governance that they did. So this is what we've been doing in the Tampa Bay area. This is a group in St. Petersburg on 10.10.10 for the 350.org. They got together and they built a community garden, and this is uh, our group shop. The whole idea with 350 is if we can change our culture to get down to 350 parts per million, we can avoid a lot of that really awful climate change where we're going to see six meters of uh, sea level rise. But the only way to do that is to actually do it. So we've been hosting different meetings and different groups all over the Tampa Bay area to design and, and plan our way towards that. We've been producing, um, for instance, here in, in the Newport Ritchie Library, we've been showing dip, uh, about 12 or 13 movies about different environmental themes. Uh, we've been talking about water. We've been talking about, uh, we showed a film last uh, month about who killed the electric car. And we had an electric car guy uh, come. He converts cars into electric. He, they tear out the motor. They put an electric motor in and they put batteries in, and he, using um, the knowledge that we have in the community, we all know what we need to do. We have all the tools, all the technology, but we're not doing it. So the whole idea with permaculture and transition is to, to plan it out and to do it. So how can we get to 350 parts per million? Well, one way that I think that's going to be important is uh, regrowing forests. I'm working right now as a permaculture designer designing a food force in Tarpon Springs. We're going to be growing food, fuel, 
Uh, we're going to be sequestering carbon. We're going to be trying uh, a form of biochar where you burn wood with no oxygen. And you, what you do is you, uh, you sequester the carbon into the ground. So you can actually make a negative cycle where carbon goes into the ground as a sink instead of always producing carbon dioxide. Uh, we've been doing permablitzes. I think we're up to eight or nine. What we do is we go to someone's house, we, we look at the entire house, and we design it to be as self-sufficient and, uh, and grow as much food around it as we possibly can. And we set a date, and we go to the person's house, and we set up a few vegetable garden. Uh, we, we look at the different things that they're using that could be more energy efficient, and we plan that out. And then we actually go about doing it. Uh, we usually have about 15 or 16 people show to, up to the permablitzes. And we have a potluck afterwards. Anything that revolves around food, people love to come to. <laughs> um, this is Food Not Lawns. There's a, they're a community garden group that's over in Tampa. I've been connecting with different communities all over the Tampa Bay area. I grew up in Tampa. I was born in St. Pete, and I, I was raised in Seminole, and now I'm living in Pasco. So Tampa Bay area is my hometown. So I like to get to know all of my friends that are in the same movement as me. Uh, this is uh, our yard sign with uh, a chicken. We're really into urban chickens. Uh, this is a film show that we showed in Tarpon Springs. We'll show a film, and then afterwards we'll come together and jot down our notes of what we learned about the film and what we can do to plan uh, regarding what the information that we learned. Um, you get a lot of real good feedback that you've never known because a lot of times we're either talked to or we're in these conversations where we don't have these little side conversations. So we always try and start up side conversations as much as possible. One way of doing that is a open space. We'll have people all scatter into different groups on, on whatever knowledge that they really are interested in and have knowledge about. And they'll have conversations and then we'll come back into a group and we'll, we'll share whatever information that we've come up with. Well this is my last photo. Uh, this was a peace gathering in Newport Ritchie. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people working all over the Tampa Bay area on this issue. And I think we just need to all gather them together and have a conversation. And we should look at the next generation, seven generations out. What are we leaving behind for the next generation? Thank you very much.